Hey, fifth grade, it's good to be with you today. Uh, we are in language class right now, and uh, we are um, in reading. Uh, we are um, in Number of the Stars, our classroom novel. And um, we ended up right here where it says, Mom and Papa have never looked at those things, not since the day they packed them away. Ellen sighed. She would have looked so beautiful in her wedding dress. She had such a pretty smile. I used to pretend that she was my sister too. She would have liked that, Emery told her. She loved you. That's the worst thing in the world, Ellen whispered. To be dead so young. I wouldn't want the Germans to take my family away, to make us live someplace else, but still, it wouldn't be as bad as being dead. Anne Marie leaned over and hugged her. They won't take you away, she said. Not your parents either. Papa promised that they were safe, and he always kept keeps his promises. And you were quite safe here with us. For a while, they continued to murmur in the dark but the murmurs were interrupted by yawns. Then Ellen's voice stopped and she turned over and in a minute her breathing was quiet and slow. Anne-Marie stared at the window where the sky was outlined and the tree branch moved slightly in the breeze. Everything seemed very familiar, very comforting. Dangers were no more than odd imaginings, like ghost stories that children made up to frighten one another, things that couldn't possibly happen. Anne-Marie felt completely safe here in her own home, with her parents in the next room and her best friend asleep beside her. She yawned contentedly and closed her eyes. It was hours later, but still dark, when she was awakened abruptly by pounding on the apartment door. Anne-Marie eased the bedroom door open quietly, only a crack, and peeked out. Behind her, Ellen was sitting up, her eyes wide. She could see Mama and Papa in their night clothes moving about. Mama held a lighted candle, but as Anne-Marie watched, she went to a lamp and switched it on. It was so long a time since they had dared to use it, the strictly rationed electricity after dark that the light in the room seemed startling to Anne-Marie, watching through the slightly open bedroom door. She saw her mother look automatically to the blackout curtains, making certain that they were tightly drawn. Papa opened the front door to the soldiers. Is this the Johansson apartment? A deep voice asked the question loudly in a terribly accented Danish. Our name is on the door and I see you have a flashlight, Papa answered. What do you want, is something wrong? I understand you are a friend of your neighbors, the Rosens, Mrs. Johansson, the soldier said angrily. Sophie Rosen is my friend, that is true, Mama said quietly. Please, could you speak more softly? My children are asleep. Then you will be so kind as to tell me where the Rosens are. He made no effort to lower his voice. I assume they are at home sleeping. It is four in the morning after all, Mama said. Anne Marie heard the soldier stalk across the living room toward the kitchen. From her hiding place in the narrow sliver of an open doorway, she could see the heavy uniformed man a holstered pistol at his waist, and the entrance to the kitchen, peering in toward the sink. Another German voice said, The Roses' apartment is empty. We're wondering if they might be visiting their good friends, the Johansons. Well, said Papa, moving slightly so that he was standing in front of Anne-Marie's bedroom door, and she could see nothing except the dark blur of his back. As you see, you are mistaken. There is no one here but my family. You will not object if we look around. The voice was harsh, and it was not a question. It seems we have no choice, Papa replied. Please don't wake my children, Mama requested again. There is no need to frighten little ones. The heavy booted feet across the floor again and into the large other bedroom. A closet door opened and closed with a bang. Anne-Marie eased her bedroom door closed slightly. She stumbled through the darkness to the bed. Ellen, she whispered urgently, take your necklace off. Ellen's hands flew to her neck. Desperately, she began trying to unhook the tiny clasp. Outside the bedroom door, the harsh voices and heavy footsteps continued. I can't get it open, Ellen said frantically. I never take it off. I can't even remember how to open it. 
Anne-Marie heard a voice just outside the door. What is here? Shh, her mother replied. My daughter's bedroom. They are sound asleep. Hold still, Anne-Marie commanded. This will hurt. She grabbed the little gold chain, yanked it with all her strength, and broke it. As the door opened and light flooded into the bedroom, she crumbled it into her hand and closed her fingers tightly. Terrified, both girls looked up at three Nazi officers who entered the room. One of the men aimed a flashlight around the bedroom. He went to the closet and looked inside. Then with a sweep of his gloved hand, he pushed to the floor several coats and a bathrobe that hung from pegs on the wall. There was nothing else in the room except a chest of drawers, the blue decorated trunk in the corner, and a heap of Kirstie's dolls piled in a small rocking chair. The flashlight beam touched each thing in turn. Angrily, the officer turned toward the bed. Get up, he ordered. Come out here. Trembling, the two girls rose from the bed and followed him, brushing past the two remaining officers in the doorway to the living room. Anne-Marie looked around. These three uniformed men were different from the ones on the street corners. The street soldiers were often young, sometimes ill at ease, and Anne-Marie remembered how the giraffe had, for a moment, let his harsh pose slip and had smiled at Kirstie. But these men were older and their faces were set with anger. Her parents were standing beside each other, their faces tense, but Kirstie was nowhere in sight. Thank goodness that Kirstie slept through almost everything. If they had wakened her, she would be wailing, or worse, she would be angry and her fists would fly. Your names, the officer barked. Anne-Marie Johansson, and this is my sister. Quiet, let her speak for herself. Your name? He was glaring at Ellen. Ellen swallowed. Lizzie, she said, and cleared her throat. Lizzie Johansson. The officer stared at them grimly. Now, Mama said in a strong voice, you have seen that we are hiding, not hiding anything. May my children go back to bed? The officer ignored her. Suddenly, he grabbed a handful of Ellen's hair. Ellen winced. He laughed scornfully. You have a blonde child sleeping in the other room, and you have this blonde daughter. He gestured toward Anne-Marie with his head. Where did you get the dark-haired one? He twisted the lock of Ellen's hair. From a different father? From the milkman? Papa stepped forward. Don't speak to my wife in such a way. Let go of my daughter or I will report you for such treatment. Or maybe you got her someplace else, the officer continued with a sneer. From the Rosens? For a moment, no one spoke. Then Anne-Marie, watching in panic, saw her father move swiftly to the small bookcase and took out a book. She saw that he was holding the family photograph album. Very quickly, he searched through its pages found what he was looking for, and tore out three pictures from three separate pages. He handed them to the German officer who released Ellen's hair. You will see each of my daughters, each with her name written on the photograph, Papa said. Anne-Marie knew instantly which photographs he had chosen. The album had many snapshots, all the poorly focused pictures of school events and birthday parties, but it also contained a portrait taken by a photographer of each girl as a tiny infant. Mama had written in her delicate handwriting the name of each baby daughter across the bottom of those photographs. She realized too with an icy feeling why Papa had torn them from the book. At the bottom of each page, below the photograph itself, was written the date. And the real Lizzie Johansson had been born 21 years earlier. Kirsten Elizabeth, the officer read, looking at Kirstie's baby picture. He let the photograph fall to the floor. Anne Marie, he read the next, glanced at her, and dropped the second photograph. Lizzie Margaret, he read finally, and stared at Ellen for a long, unwavering moment. In her mind, Anne Marie pictured the photograph that he held. The baby, wide eyed, propped against a pillow, her tiny hand holding a silver teething ring her bare feet visible below the hem of an embroidered dress, the wispy curls dark. The officer tore the photograph in half and dropped the pieces on the floor. Then he turned the heels of his shiny boots grinding into the pictures and left the apartment. Without a word, the other two officers followed. Papa stepped forward and closed the door behind them. Anne-Marie relaxed 
the clenched fingers of her right hand, which still clutched Ellen's necklace. She looked down and saw that she had imprinted the Star of David into her palm. Chapter six, is the weather good for fishing? We must think what to do, Papa said. They are suspicious now. To be honest, I thought that if they came here at all, and I hope they wouldn't, that they would just glance around, see what they had no place to hide anyone, and would go away. I'm sorry I have dark hair, Ellen murmured. I made them suspicious. Mama reached over quickly and took Ellen's hand. You have beautiful hair, Ellen, just like your mama's, she said. Don't ever be sorry for that. Weren't we lucky that Papa thought so quickly and found the pictures? And weren't we lucky that Lizzie had dark hair when she was a baby? It turned blonde later on when she was two or so. In between, Papa added, she was bald for a while. Ellen and Anne Marie both smiled tentatively. For a moment, their fear was eased. Tonight was the first time Anne Marie realized suddenly that Mama and Papa had spoken of Lizzie. The first time in three years. Outside, the sky was beginning to lighten. Mrs. Johansson went to the kitchen and began to make tea. I've never been up so early before, Anne Marie said. Ellen and I will probably fall asleep in school today. Papa rubbed his chin for a moment, thinking, I think we must not take the risk of sending you to school today, he said. It is possible that they will look for the Jewish children in the schools. Not go to school? Ellen asked in amazement. My parents have always told me that education is the most important thing. Whatever happens, I must get an education. This will only be a vacation, Ellen. For now, your safety is the most important thing. I'm sure your parents would agree. Inga? Papa called Mama in the kitchen. And she came to the doorway with a teacup in her hand and a questioning look on her face. Yes. We must take the girls to Henrik's. You remember what Peter told us? I think today is the day to go to your brother's. Mrs. Johansson nodded. I think you are right, but I will take them. You must stay here. Stay here and let you go alone? Of course not. I wouldn't send you on a dangerous trip alone. Mama put a hand on Papa's arm. If only I go with the girls, it will be safer. They are unlikely to suspect a woman and her children. But if they are watching us, if they see all of us leave, if they are aware that the apartment is empty, that you don't go to your office this morning, then they will know. Then it will be dangerous, and I am not afraid to go alone. It was very seldom that Mama disagreed with Papa. Anne-Marie watched his face and knew that he was struggling with the decision. Finally, he nodded reluctantly. I will pack some things, Mama said. What time is it? Papa looked at his watch. Almost five, he said. Henrik will still be there. He leaves around five. Why don't you call him? Papa went to the telephone. Ellen looked puzzled. Who is Henrik? Where does he go at five in the morning, she asked. Anne-Marie laughed. He's my uncle, my mother's brother, and he's a fisherman. They leave very early, all the fishermen. Each morning, their boats go out at sunrise. Oh, Ellen, she went on. You will love it there. It is where my grandparents live, where Mama and Uncle Henrik grew up. It is so beautiful, right on the water. You can stand at the edge of the meadow and look across Sweden. She listened while Papa spoke on the telephone to Uncle Henry, telling him that Mama and the children were coming for a visit. Ellen had gone to the bathroom and closed the door. Mama was still in the kitchen, so only Anne Marie was listening. It was a very puzzling conversation. So, Henrik, is the weather good for fishing? Papa asked cheerfully and listened briefly. Then he continued. I'm sending Inga to you today with the children, and she will be bringing you a carton of cigarettes. Yes, just one, he said after a moment. Anne-Marie couldn't hear Uncle Henrik's words, but there are a lot of cigarettes available in Copenhagen now, if you know where to look, he went on. And so there will be others coming to you as well, I'm sure. But it wasn't true. Anne-Marie was quite certain it wasn't true. Cigarettes were the thing that Papa missed, the way Mama missed coffee. He complained often, he had complained only yesterday, that there were no cigarettes in the stores. The men in his office, he said, making a face, smoked almost anything. Sometimes dried weeds rolled in paper and the smell was terrible. Why was Papa speaking that way, almost as if he were speaking in a code? 
what was mama really taking to Uncle Henrik? Then she knew it was Ellen. So by now you understand that when Papa was talking to Henrik and he said um, a carton of cigarettes, what he meant by carton of cigarettes was Ellen, right? That was what they were going to be bringing. It would be new to Uncle Henrik. Okay. The train ride north along the Danish coast was very beautiful. Again and again, they could see the sea from the windows. Anne-Marie had made this trip often to her grandparents when they were alive and later after they were gone to see the cheerful, suntan, unmarried uncle whom she loved. But the trip was new to Ellen, who sat with her face pressed to the window, watching the lovely homes along the seaside, the small farms and villages. Look, Anne-Marie exclaimed and pointed to the opposite side. It's Klampenburg and the Deer Park. Oh, I wish we could stop here just for a little while. Mama shook her head. Not today, she said. The train did stop at the Klampenburg station, but none of the few passengers got off. Have you ever been there, Ellen? Mama asked, but Ellen said no. Well, someday you will go. Someday you will walk through the park and you will see the hundreds of deer, tame and free. Kirsty wiggled to her knees and peered through the window. I don't see any deer, she complained. They are there, I'm sure, Mama told her. They're hiding in the trees. The train started again. The door at the end of the, their car opened and two German soldiers appeared. Anne-Marie tensed. Not here. On the train, too? They were everywhere. Together, the soldiers strolled through the car, glancing at passengers, stopping here and there to ask a question. One of them had something stuck in his teeth. He probed with his tongue and distorted his own face. Anne-Marie watched with a kind of frightened fascination as the pair approached. One of the soldiers looked down with a bored expression on his face. Where are you going? He asked. Gilalai, Mama replied. My brother lives there. We are going to visit them. The soldier turned away and Anne-Marie relaxed. Then without warning, he turned back. Are you visiting your brother for the new year? He asked suddenly. Mama stared at him with a puzzled look. New year? She asked. It is only October. And guess what? Kirsty exclaimed suddenly in a loud voice looking at the soldier. Anne-Marie's heart sank and she looked at her mother. Mama's eyes were frightened. Shh, Kirsty, Mama said. Don't chatter so. But Kirsty paid no attention to Mama as usual. She looked cheerfully at the soldier, and Amory knew what she was about to say. This is our friend Ellen, and it's her new year. But she didn't. Instead, Kirsty pointed at her feet. I'm going to visit my Uncle Henrik, she chirped, and I'm wearing my brand new shiny black shoes. The soldier chuckled and moved on. Amory gazed through the window again. The trees, the Baltic Sea, and the cloudy October sky passed in a blur as they continued north along the coast. Smell the air, Mama said when they stepped off the train and made their way to the narrow street. Isn't it lovely and fresh? It always brings back memories for me. The air was breezy and cool and carried the sharp, not unpleasant smell of salt and fish. High against the pale clouds, seagulls soared and cried out as if they were mourning. Mama looked at her watch. I wonder if Henrik will be back yet, but it doesn't matter. The house is always unlocked. Come on, girls, we'll walk. It isn't far, just a little under two miles. And it's a nice day. We'll take the path through the woods instead of the road. It's a little longer, but it's so pretty. Didn't you love the castle when we went through Helsinger, Ellen? Kirsty asked. She had been talking about Kronberg Castle ever since they had seen it, sprawling massive and ancient beside the sea from the train. I wish we could have stopped to visit the castle. Kings live there and Queens. Okay, at this point, I would like you to just read, uh, pause just, just this page, read the rest of this page. And now I'd like you to pause and um, read the rest of this page, and that will bring us um, to the end of this chapter, and we will pick up um, at the next chapter next time. Good to be with you today, and we will see you soon. Bye.